So um, <clears throat> let's move now from the expanses of the universe down to the fundamental building blocks of life. <clears throat> so it turns out that the building blocks of life, primarily nucleic acids, proteins, and sugars, um, all share one thing in common, and that is their polymers. <clears throat> so polymers, we think of something like paint or glue or plastics. Um, but in biology, polymers do much more interesting things. Nucleic acids store the information of life. Proteins are the machinery of life. And sugars are sort of the energy source of life. <clears throat> so as a material scientist, I look at this and say, you know, gee, what's up with this polymer thing? Um, and, and furthermore, what is a polymer? And a polymer is a particular structure. It's a, it's a linear chain of building blocks strung together like beads on a string. And so why does nature use that type of architecture? And the answer is, I think, is pretty simple. Um, and that is, it's about a simple set of building blocks. It's very efficient to build stuff from a common set of building blocks. And so here I'm showing the 20 amino acids that represent all the, the, all the building blocks you need to make any protein in our body. And the way that nature does this is by stringing them together in a particular sequence. So it's the actual order of monomers in the chain that determines a protein's shape and its function. And uh, essentially, you can think of the sequence as folding instructions that tell the chain how to adopt a particular structure. And so here I'm just showing some of my favorite protein structures, um, like silk is one. This is a viral capsid. Proteins also do um, interesting things like bind very specifically, like myoglobin binds oxygen. Here's a DNA binding protein. Uh, and proteins also catalyze chemical transformations. So as a material scientist, we want to learn from this, this blueprint set from nature and understand how to build synthetic materials that are much more stable and rugged and we could use in industrial processes and as sensors and that kind of thing. So um, <clears throat> what we need to understand then is the relationship of the sequence of monomers to structures like these. And so I liken this to origami. Origami, you take a common starting material, a piece of paper, and by providing very specific instructions, you can achieve all kinds of different shapes, okay? So the key is, I mean, if you've tried this, it's actually pretty hard. <laughs> the key is understanding these folding instructions. Um, and so that's what I'm doing uh, in my research. So here, is the chemical structure of a protein, just a short chunk of it, we call a peptide. And in my research, um, <clears throat> here I'm showing the uh, amino acid building blocks. These are all linked together, one after the other. And what I invented in my lab are molecules that are very similar, but totally synthetic. These are called peptoids. And the cool thing about peptoids, here's the <clears throat> unnatural amino acid unit. These are not degraded by uh, enzymes, so they're much more rugged and stable. So the question is, how do we um, link these together? How can we make materials out of them? The, another neat thing is the chemistry we developed uh, is amenable to using all kinds of different shapes and sizes of these so-called R groups, or the side chains. And we developed um, synthesis uh, methods that um, where we use robots to link these units together. So here, um, showing an addition of one of these beads along the chain. Um, and we can make all kinds of different sequences in parallel and then evaluate which ones work the best. So here we're adding uh, one monomer, here's another monomer, and we can do parallel reactions. It takes about an hour to add each building block, and so we can, it takes time, and. Uh, but you can do it while, the robot can do it while you're home sleeping. So, <clears throat> what do we make? Well, so we need to learn from biology. So here's uh, an example, a beautiful protein called green fluorescent protein. It's from jellyfish, it actually glows green. And we can learn from this by looking at it through special set of glasses, which um, I will simulate for you. If we consider 
the building blocks that make up this protein. Uh, if we look at this through, a, through special glasses that only show you amino acids that like water and amino acids that don't like water. So this idea of oil and water separating from one another is one of the fundamental things. So when we look at it that way, you can see some interesting patterns. So red is hydrophilic, that means it likes to be in contact with water, and yellow is hydrophobic, that means it hates water. And what you'll see is this striping pattern. And what that does, that sort of sequence arrangement, you'll notice puts all the yellow groups in the inside and all the red groups on the outside. And it makes sense, these proteins exist in water. Uh, these, what other way can you hide from water except by clustering into the inside? So we applied this rule to non-natural peptoids. So here I'm just showing the chemical structure where the yellow is the hydrophobic group and the red is the hydrophilic group. So this is, I would call this a two-fold repeating pattern. So we made synthetic peptoids with the same exact pattern uh, and asked, well, what's it gonna do? What's it gonna fold into? Uh, and to our surprise, we're not expecting this kind of thing, but we end up making what we now call nanosheets, very highly ordered material, these very sharp edges, very surprising that uh, these polymers are very flexible, like cooked spaghetti, and yet somehow um, they recognize each other and form very ordered materials. Um, this is a little bit harder to see, but you can see, uh, you can see these by uh, optical microscopy. They're up to about a tenth of a millimeter in size. It's, it's pretty large. Um, and so here I'm highlighting one nanosheet. And we're wondering, okay, what is, the, what is the structure of this material? And what can we learn from what we synthesized? And we find that the peptoid chains actually stack up in this brick-like pattern. And they stretch out, and when they meet their neighbors and make these, like floorboards, uh, this highly ordered uh, structure. And so this section of sheet is actually about 800 million peptoids lined up next to each other. And how do we know that? <clears throat> we can see that. So up at Berkeley Lab, we have uh, some of the most powerful electron microscopes in the world. This is at the National Center of Electron Microscopy. And here you can see individual peptoid chains running parallel to each other. Uh, this is the very edge of a sheet. And, okay, so let me just wrap up by saying um, it makes sense to hide all these hydrophobic groups in the center. And um, the last thing is um, this is a movie now that we're employing, we're getting our supercomputers and our theory colleagues together to look at actually how these form and use this to engineer future uh, advanced materials. So thank you.